Welcome to this CNBC Africa special. My name is Esther Awuni. Our special guest today is Nigeria's Honorable Minister of Finance, Kemi Adioshun. In the next half hour, we'll be discussing issues ranging from budget to spending, but more importantly, what the fiscal authorities are doing to stir this economy out of the current recession. Honorable Minister, it's a pleasure to have you here today. What do you say to people, economists, who continually say that it doesn't appear that the fiscal authorities have a clear economic plan on how to get this economy out of the current recession? Okay. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for, um, for this opportunity to speak uh, to, to the people and to the, to the community. I mean, I think to answer your question, I have to context it and frame it. Um, and, and recession is, as you know, technically, it's two negative, successive negative quarters of negative growth. But actually, if you look at the trend of the Nigerian economy, we've been in slowdown. Growth has been slowing down consistently since 2012. We had one little uptick, and that was sort of 2014, 2015, and that was largely driven by election spending. So really, this trend of negative growth has been building. Um, and it's culminated in, in, um, in, in where we find ourselves today, which is recession. Now, when we started, we had looked at this situation and realized that the way to, to, to counter this trend, which was then negative growth that has now become a recession, was to act what we call counter-cyclically. That is, the government to provide, provide a stimulus spending to counter um, the threat. It was then the threat of recession. And we put together the budget. Uh, as, as far back as, as, as December last year, which had a fiscal stimulus. Spend your way out of trouble. That was the plan. Um, we have stuck to that plan, and, and that plan was very clear. One, we were overly dependent on oil. Two, we needed to invest in our infrastructure, because our infrastructure would do two things. One, it would allow us that spend, which we needed to do. But more importantly, it would unlock the competitiveness and the latent opportunities in the economy. And so that plan stays, that plan remains. We haven't changed that plan. The other thing that was in that budget, even before the recession, was the fact that we realized that there was going to be pain on the people. And so we put in 500 million of social intervention, 500 billion, sorry, of social intervention programs, which are direct programs to alleviate um, poverty. So I think we do have a plan. It's a very credible plan. And it's the only plan that will work, incidentally, even those people that, you know, and I do listen to the commentary. The commentary is not you don't have a plan or you have the wrong plan. The commentary is we want you to act faster. Fine. And I think we accept that and we're, we're trying to address some of the bottlenecks. But nobody has come about in Nigeria and said, don't invest in infrastructure. Nobody has said that um, uh, a stimulus will not work. Everybody agrees on the solution. The question is, how quickly can we roll it out? And that's what we're working on addressing now. We're talking about uh, rolling out these plans or policies quickly. You talked about, you've mentioned uh, the fiscal lags that we have, you know, making processes a lot you know, faster, mm. time for procurement times a little uh, more sh uh, shorter. Mm. What specific steps are you taking to make that happen? A, a, a range. I mean, one of the things is, is engaging very closely, as we've said, with the, with the National Assembly. We've looked at the procurement laws. Yes, they, they're there for the usual times, advertise everything. Um, and, and that's a good thing because that provides opportunity, that provides competitiveness, that allows us to get the best value for the money we're spending. And that's consistent with what this government is trying to do. It also promotes transparency and opportunity for Nigerians because if you only let contracts in your ministry to people you know, that's nepotism. And we, we don't want to be part of that, we want to follow due process. However, if due process is actually slowing us down, then I think, considering where we are, we need to look at those processes and procedures. And we're interfacing with the National Assembly to see how we can shorten some of these processes so that we can let a contract, it shouldn't take 12 weeks, why can't we do it in four weeks? That, that eight week delay we can't afford right now. So that's what uh, we're working on. We're also looking at some of the, the, the processes and the procedures that just slow things down. For example, we're working at the moment on a transaction that w with GE, General Electric, that would allow us to use the existing, the old rail system for freight. Um, but the, the bottlenecks, the um, bureaucratic bottlenecks have to be sorted out. So what we did on that is put a multi-sectoral team together. So it's myself, uh, the Chief of Staff, the Minister for Transport, Minister for Budget and Planning, Minister for Environment, Minister for Power, sitting in the room with BPE, the, all the various relevant staff, and sitting in the room and saying, look, what is the problem? Let's sit down and work through uh, what needs to be done to get this transaction moving. And so, that, so those things are happening. Okay, let's talk briefly about the Naira, uh, I mean, the, the ethics issue that we continue to have. Now, many economists believe that uh, the Naira would have been better off 
today if we had allowed it to flood earlier? What do you say to that? Um, well, we had indicated that we would move to a flexible exchange rate. We recognised we needed a flexible exchange rate. And, and, and what is the problem with the Naira? The Naira problem is that 90%, the source of 90% of our Naira is oil, and the price of oil had fallen. So you had a shortage of Naira, but you had demand for Naira pent-up demand and current demand because our economy is largely import-driven. So we're always going to have a foreign exchange problem. And I think the monetary authorities were trying uh, to manage it in, in the way they, they saw fit. Uh, but at the beginning of the year, the president did say, look, we're going to move to a flexible exchange rate. Um, would the Naira be better um, had it happened earlier? I'm not sure how to answer that question other than to say that at the moment you still have two rates. So it's a new policy and it needs to bed down. You can't have uh, that spread that we currently have. It's an arbitrage opportunity. It, it needs to uh, be resolved. So I think rather than answer that question, what I would say is that we still need to ad make some necessary adjustments to ensure that that spread is narrowed so that you have a true price discovery for the Naira. The question I think that economists are asking and investors certainly are asking, what is the true price of the Naira? Is it the parallel black market rate or is it the official rate or, as is the opinion of many of us, is it somewhere in the middle? And how do we get that price discovery resolved? That's the issue that I think the monetary authorities are working very hard on. And the Monetary Policy Committee, I believe, have a meeting uh, imminently. And I, I'm sure it's something they'll be looking to address. But as Finance Minister, what kind of um, adjustments would you like to see the monetary authorities take? For me, as Finance Minister, my, our fiscal policy, or our fiscal focus has always been to stimulate the economy. And much of what we were doing was driven by debt. We were going to be borrowing. We had said that. We would borrow uh, domestically and borrow internationally, which is what we're doing. So what hurts us more from our strategy is interest rate. We need lower interest rates because, of course, when we're borrowing and interest rates go up, um, it increases our cost of, of debt service and it reduces the amount of money that is available to spend on capital projects. So from our perspective, the alignment we'd like to see is, is that interest rate um, increase that happened at the last MPC to be reconsidered. Um, and I think that the rationale for that is that the attempt was to manage inflation. And, and the trade-off for the economy right now is what's a bigger problem? Is it growth or inflation? For me, it's growth. I would rather seek growth. We can manage inflation. Um, but you, you know, you have to have a trade-off. And I think for us at the moment in the Nigerian economy, growth is the most important thing. Let's go for growth. Let's stimulate the economy. To get out of recession, we need lower interest rates. Businesses need lower interest rates because, of course, when the interest rate goes up, it increases the cost of borrowing, even for businesses as well as for government. So we do need to have that interest rate um, uh, regime that is conducive to what we're trying to do on, on the fiscal side. That's, for me, uh, something I, I'd like to see. And I, I'm sure that the Monetary Policy Committee, having looked at what the impact of the increase in interest rate uh, has been minimal because it's not a money supply problem. It's actually cost push. It's actually the effect of uh, the increase in transport costs, the increase in uh, forex that is pushing through to costs. It's not that there's too much money in the system that needs to be mopped up by increasing interest rates. So we, we, we'd be very excited if we could see that uh, reviewed. It, it's interesting you say all this because we know that the monetary authorities obviously always look to the fiscal authorities first to, to drive growth. And I've heard the central bank governor say on several occasions that every time they keep having to dig deeper into their toolbox mm. to get you know, policies that, you know, just to, to, get, to keep the economy afloat. But you know, they keep saying that growth, obviously, that has to come from the fiscal side. Mm. So they throw the ball into your court. Mm. Well, I think, I mean, the fiscal strategy, as I said, is, has been very clear. Um, from the beginning. We said we need to move from a consumption-led economy to an investment-led economy. We need the investment to be in place to drive the growth that we need. Um, I don't think it's a trade-off between monetary and fiscal. I think what it is is there's, there's got to be an alignment um, and we both complement e each other. Um, I think that's the solution. I, I'm not sure they throw the ball into our court. I think what they're trying to say is that they're trying to do what they can do, but we are of the opinion that it, uh, the fiscal strategy is clear. The fiscal strategy is we need to invest and grow this economy. And so the monetary, and that's the long-term strategy. Remember, we have a medium-term strategy. It's showing where we're going for the next three years. Monetary will align with that and adjust to accommodate that. Okay, let's talk about the cabinet retreat on the economy that uh, was held recently. We had the ministries, departments and agencies, the economic team, and of course the president and the vice president. And there was talk about uh, having to, have, to ensure that 
the ministries, departments and agencies, uh, they're all aligned in terms of plan targets and then budgetary outcomes. That has been a problem over the years and has, we know, uh, impeded growth. T talk us through what the key outcomes were. I mean, I think it was, a, it was an interesting interface because you, we had a number of um, uh, presentations from various economists and then we moved into groups and began to really deep dive into what the challenges are. Um, I think the key outcomes are there's, there's a lot more understanding, uh, there's, there's less working in silos. I think one of the big problems is where ministries and agencies work in silos. I think there's a lot more cohesion and a lot more understanding of what each other's objectives are. But I think from the economic perspective, um, the, the big outcome is just a reinforcement that, look, the strategy we have put together is the right strategy and we've got to stick with it. But we've got to monitor it, we've got to manage it, we've got to make sure that the expected outcomes are delivered to the people. Okay, now, at that meeting also there were economists, financial experts, and it's not the first time that the fiscal authorities are meeting mm. uh, with these experts and from the private sector. Mm. And we know that uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how the federal government perhaps uh, does not listen to these you know, mm. other voices or the experts as it were, but we've seen you engage with, uh, engage with them now. So what is going to be different now that you're engaging with a set of people? I, I, what is I, going to be different I going think, forward? I think, um, I think that perception is the wrong one. And let me correct it. We've always engaged with the private sector. Always. No government, I mean, it would be very foolish of any member of government to sit down in your room with civil servants and to begin to design policies. That's not the case. The difference, and I think this has been misinterpreted, the difference with this one is that what we've said is that we, we consult, all governments consult with the private sector, by the way, all around the world, but they consult with them quietly. You don't have a situation where certain uh, members of business are associated with a particular administration. That is wrong. But you do consult with them. The same names, incidentally, that were on the economic management team before, we still consult with. We speak to them off record. We speak to them sometimes on record. They come, they address the management, uh, the economic management team. But it's not a formal, you are part of those making policy. A consultative body, every government does that, by the way. And usually it's done quietly. Um, and that's the best way to do it. You consult with people quietly. You, you get subject matter experts that you speak to on uh, policy issues before you design them. So the engagement with the private sector is not new. I think the problem is people are used to seeing it very formal and they all sit together. It's an informal engagement and that's the way it goes on all, all around the world. But when it's formal, then as yesterday, then you, you saw them. But those same people that you saw, we've probably met once a month since we've been in office. Those same economists, but they won't tell anybody and they shouldn't tell anybody because they're, they're, they're the think tank. They're people sitting behind government, helping government to formulate policy. They're also the people that you bounce ideas off. So once people know who they are, then it's very easy to influence government policy. You shouldn't know who government are, are speaking to. But we have formal engagements with MAN, the Manufacturers Association, the NESG. Those are formal engagements and they're televised and covered. So I think it's a... It's just a different style that has been misinterpreted. People just think, oh, they're not engaging. No, we've, we engage fully, and we've engaged fully at every uh, stage along the process, from the Lagos Business School to the CEOs of, of banks and captains of industry. Of course, we engage with them fully. OK. I wanted to talk about spending, government spending in 2017, and of course, how the federal government uh, wants to reprioritize some projects. But before then, Let's just take a quick break. I've been speaking to Nigeria's Honorable Minister of Finance, Kemi Adeyoshun, looking at uh, issues in the, economy of, in the economy and, of course, how the fiscal authorities are getting the economy out of the woods. Join us again. Welcome back to the CNBC Africa special. My guest today is Nigeria's Honorable Minister of Finance, Kemi Adiyashu, Honorable Minister, thank you so much for your time. Back to my last question, talking about spending, the government spending in 2017, you're looking to review the fiscal plan and also to reprioritize spending. Tell us about that. Well, we, we have a medium-term strategy already in place for the next three years. And, and as I said, the fiscal strategy remains. It's moving from uh, spending, consumption-driven, to an investment for growth strategy. So we continue with that. But I think the big things that will change in 2017 is that we have a number of platforms that we've put together that are more along the PPP line. And that's because we've had a chance to analyze our infrastructure deficit. And it's very clear that even with hugely improved allocation to capital, um, incidentally, 
between the time the budget was passed, which was May, and now we've already spent over 420 billion for capital only. Um, uh, today, we'll release another 350 billion for capital. That's more than was spent for the whole of last year, would have been done in four months. And we're going to continue at that pace. We're raising money so that we just keep the money pumping into the economy until we, we start to see the growth that we need. But we've looked and analysed the infrastructure deficit very carefully and realised that, look, even with the increased allocation to capital, the infrastructure deficit is such that government on its own can't do it. Uh, and so we've consistently said we'll look for opportunities to partner with the private sector. So we have a number of um, PPP and PFI type platforms where government will contribute some of the money and then the rest of the money will be raised from the private sector and we will have user fees to, to actually pay for them, particularly in the area of roads, where it's very clear that you know the, the deficit is huge. And people argue, when you say the user pays, that means tolling the road. But my argument is this, that when you spend six hours on a journey that should take you an hour, you're paying anyway. You're paying in terms of the petrol, you're paying in terms of your time, you're paying in terms of the wear and tear on your vehicle. So why not just pay a toll and, and, and do the journey in an hour? I don't think the Nigerians, the Nigerian public have a problem with paying. In fact, we pay very heavily for everything now. It's just a different kind of more formalized pay. So what we've been doing is we've been working with PENCOM and the Sovereign Wealth Authority and the DMO to structure instruments that will enable us to raise infrastructure bonds specifically for toll and tollable projects. And that will considerably increase the amount of spend on capital. So that will complement what the government is doing. It will also bring private money in. And we've had um, uh, quite a lot of interest, both locally and internationally, to come and invest in such instruments. Uh, and we have a similar platform for housing. Again, we'll be rolling that out. Okay. I mean, obviously, that, that's a lot of spending, a magnitude of financing. What, what are the expected effects on the domestic markets? Domestic debt markets? Well, our, our sense on the domestic debt market is I, I've always been of the view that government needs to come out of it more. And one of the things that we're working on is how we restructure our inherited uh, debt portfolio. The debt to GDP ratio is comfortable, but the debt service ratio is very high. And that's because most of the debt that we owe um, actually matures, is repaid in the next two years. Now, infrastructure are long-term projects. There is no point in borrowing short for long projects. It's going to take time for some of these projects to pay back. Take your railway projects. It takes 30, 40 years to get payback from railway. Roads, 30, 40 years. So there's no point in borrowing short-term, issuing treasury bills and driving up the treasury bill rate uh, to fund long-term projects. So one of the things we're working on with the DMO is how do we restructure this debt portfolio, come out of uh, the short term, look more to the international markets um, and, and, and raise long-term money for long-term projects. Now you've talked about the fact that you want this economy to be an investment-led economy and we knew that uh, all the monies that are going to be borrowed in 2016 are going to be borrowed for projects. Mm. How, what, what are the assurances that these projects can pay back the costs? Well I think uh, it's back to the argument of what is the role of government? We're, we're, we're providing public goods. If I provide roads, that's the job of government. That's the payback. The payback comes in taxes. The payback comes in improvements in business. Um, the payback comes in unleashing the competitiveness of the Nigerian economy that drives growth, drives business. The payback is having fewer Nigerians unemployed. So for me, the payback is that if we drive the economy and there's growth, uh, there'll be payback in terms of taxes, in terms of reducing the burden of unemployment, in terms of improved quality of life for the people. Government has to provide infrastructure. That's one of the jobs of, of government. And I think if we look at it, we can't just look at it as a, um, uh, almost like a private sector thing. Okay, you have, this project must pay back this amount. Uh, infrastructure doesn't work that way. Infrastructure is really the oil that drives uh, the growth of the economy and the payback may, well, may not be direct. The payback can be indirect in terms of growth of the economy, opening up of certain areas, uh, unleashing certain industries and, and from the growth of those industries there will be payback. Still on financing, we know that the government is also at this time preparing a $1 billion euro bond. Tell us more about that, the kind of rates that we're looking at and when we can put this deal together. Right, well, well the, the, the um, procurement process again for the appointment of advisors, is, is, it closes, I believe, next week. And I've said to the DMO, let's just quickly um, appoint so that we can hit the road. We had already started the work. We started reaching out to investors and talking to investors with a non-deal outreach, where we just began to speak to investors around what we were doing. So we already have quite strong indications. And indeed, we had some commitments. Even though we weren't doing a deal, we already have 
commitments to our, to our bond offer. So we're, we're very confident that it's just a question of, of pricing. And of course, we'll try and price it as keenly as possible. Um, the international markets are awash with capital. They're awash with liquidity. We've seen the Ghana deal. Um, uh, we, we think that um, we can do very well in the market. We think we have a very compelling economic story. Um, we've been working now for a year with the, with the international community. Um, we think, uh, of course, the macro uh, picture uh, weaken slightly, so we expect um, that the ratings may downgrade us a little, but I, I don't think that that changes the outcome of the Eurobond issue. We're very confident that before the end of the year would have closed. You don't think investors, international investors, would demand more? I mean, given our current macroeconomic no. situation, we would no. demand more to hold on to Absolutely our not. In fact, if anything, we've seen a strengthening in, our, in the trading of our, of our, our bonds. Um, we have, Nigeria, you see, Nigeria remains a compelling story. Recession, yes, but Nigeria remains a very compelling investor. Yeah, but there are certain uncertainties that you know, still keep investors, you know, make them nervous. Which investors are you, are you talking about? Interna especially international investors. Portfolio we need investors. Portfolio, yes, with PFIs. The portfolio investors for the Eurobond, if you're talking about the Eurobond, are investing in dollars. Okay, so it's a dollar, um, a dollar trade. And um, as I say, we already have commitments. Um, for, for, for the Eurobond. Even without asking, we already have commitments. So, so we're very confident around um, raising a billion dollars. What I'm more uh, interested in is looking at 2017. Uh, how do we fund the 2017 budget? Um, and I think we've started to work on that and look at a, a, a mixed strategy of debt and asset realizations that we will need to fund the 2017 budget. I don't have any fears around the Eurobond offer. I don't, we don't get that impression. Um, when you go out there to talk to you, when you go no. on road shows, you, you, you speak to international people investors, understand what, 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 what is doing. the body language? What? People understand what we're doing. People understand that we, we've been honest um, around our challenges, that we have a credible strategy for working on those challenges, and, and those strategies are beginning to yield results. They've seen that we're clearly serious about reducing our recurrent expenditure. They've seen that we're clearly serious about increasing capital investment. They've seen that we're very, very serious around transparency and uh, corruption, fighting corruption. Um, and they can see that if Nigeria just does what it says it's going to do, which is invest in its infrastructure, get its infrastructure sorted out, invest in capital, that the economy can be turned around. The, the potential has always been there. The problem has always been that we've never done what needed to be done, um, and which, is, which is sort out your infrastructure. Your infrastructure is your biggest problem. Ease of doing business is also clearly a problem, and the Minister of Trade and Investment is working on that. There's a, a presidential initiative on the ease of doing business. We're actually working through some of these bottlenecks around everything from getting visas to getting business permits. That's being worked on as well. So, so we, we still think Nigeria is a very compelling uh, compelling story. Okay, back to back home to the to the fiscal authorities. We know that you have a huge personnel cost, huge you know, salaries being paid every month, over 150 billion. Mm. Is this a burden that the federal government can continue to carry? Mm. I, I would answer by saying, well, it actually started at 165 billion. We've brought it down, and we continue to bring it down with a, a, an initiative called continuous audit because when we came in, there were no controls. So we do think there's still some opportunity to bring that. Uh, burden down. I think um, at a time when unemployment is one of the biggest problems that Nigeria faces, uh, we have to live with that salary bill. The question is, what is the value being delivered for that money? Now, that's the challenge and that's the reform that was discussed, part of things that was discussed yesterday at the retreat, is how do we get civil service reform? How do we get public sector reform? So even if we're going to employ all these people, what exactly are they doing? What value are they adding? Are they being deployed to the areas of greatest need? Or are they just sitting in offices doing nothing? And I think the, the, the uh, authorities have been challenged and I think there will be some restructurings and, and uh, initiatives that will make that money work better for us. You know, if you're paying 165 billion and a lot of it is going on teachers and therefore your education indices are improving, then you don't have a problem. If you pay 165 billion and a lot of it is going on health and on midwives and, and, and uh, mother mortality, uh, female mortality and infant mortality is going down, your indices are improving, then you don't have a problem. If we have more social workers, then we don't have a problem. So the question has to be is what exactly are we spending money on? What is the quality? What is the deliverable? And if we see that certain agencies are overstaffed, do we need to redeploy them and move them into other directions? I think that's the, that's the sort of narrative that's being discussed at the moment. Okay, finally, Honourable Minister, one last question. As Finance Minister, what keeps you up at night? Work. 
in a simple word. I, you know, we work. I, I mean, you, you, what part you, of the economy? I mean, obviously, you're dealing with so much. I'm not worried about any aspect of it. My only fear is, can we move quickly enough? That's the only concern I have, is how quickly can we move? What, what keeps me up at night and gets me sending text messages to people at three in the morning is, have you done this? You, you're meant to be doing that. Where is it? Um, I'm in a great hurry. Um, I think that there's a sense of urgency around what we're doing. I think there are things that we can do a lot faster. So that's what keeps me up at night. Get up, fire off a few emails. Let's just get this thing moving. Because we can see clearly that the few initiatives we've done, we've seen the payoff. So we start to think, what if we start to consistently do things properly? What if, you know, you remove the corruption, you remove the wastage, you start to have proper value for money in your spending? What could Nigeria do? That's the question. That's what keeps me up at night is the potential of Nigeria and the real desire to see Nigeria really fire. I don't think anybody has really seen this economy fire. I mean, this economy really, you know, go into fifth gear. I don't think we have. We've always been on third gear, oil and then we leave everything else. Uh, you know, uh, it's always been either or. Now we're saying and. Let's have oil and some manufacturing. Let's have oil and infrastructure. Let's have oil and agriculture. And I think that's when this economy will really begin to show what it can do. Thank you, Honourable Minister. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for your time today. I've been speaking to Nigeria's Honourable Minister of Finance, Kemi Adyoshio. That's a wrap on this CNBC Africa special. I'm Esther Awuni. Bye for now.